Hey, and welcome back to another video. And today we're going to be going over state flow agents. Now the keyword there is state because we're going to have different states and in each state you can have any number of agents. So once all the agents are done performing a task in one state, they'll move on to the next and then those agents or even just a single agent will try to perform something until we're done with the last state. Now, personally, I like this controlled way of the flow of all the agents, but let's just get into the explanation so I can show you what I mean. All right, so before we begin, these are the four agents that I'm going to be showing you and kind of going over how this works. We have the initializer and the executor. They're going to be user agents or user proxy agents. And then the coder and the scientists are going to be both assistant agents. Let's first talk about what a group chat looks like. We create a group chat. So we'll have a group chat of three different agents. Then we create a group chat manager. And then the initializer or some user proxy agent initiates a chat with that group chat manager. And then the group chat talks among each other and uh, we, get out, we get an output. Okay, so here's another way that we're gonna look at this now with state flow. Here we have three different states. Each state is a green circle. The first state is the initializer, okay? This is the agent, it only has one agent in the state, and this agent is going to start the chat and go, go to the next state and then give them the information that we want them to uh, talk to the LLM about. In this case, we want the initializer to tell the next state that we want to retrieve some papers online. So then we move on from initializer to the next state. And in this state, we have two different agents. We have a coder and we have an executor. The coder is going to write up some Python code that is going to go out to the web, retrieve some information for us, and then send that to the executor. Well, then the executor is going to try to actually execute the code that the coder just wrote. If it wasn't successful, we're going to send that back to the coder. And we're going to keep this kind of loop between the coder and the executor until the code from the coder is successfully executed. Once it is successfully executed, we are done with this state. And then we're going to move on to the last state, which is comprised of the scientist. And the scientist is going to summarize everything that the code retrieved online. So the thing is here is that we have three different states, again, by the three circles. And each state can have more than one agent, right? And each agent is just going to do something within their states before it gets sent off to the next state. Okay, so how's it going to look in code? Well, how is this actually going to work? How do we make state flow happen? Well, the first thing is we're going to have a function called state transition that takes in a parameter called last speaker, which is just the last agent that spoke in the chat. Whenever we go to initiate the chat, there will be another parameter that can take this function in. And what's going to happen is once we initiate the chat, when the first agent is done speaking, which in this case will be initializer, when they're done speaking, we're going to call this function, right? So then we say, if the last speaker is the initializer, then return the coder. Okay, so that means now the coder is going to perform whatever it needs to do to write the code based when it calls the LLM, it's going to write that Python code. And then whenever it's done, we call this function again. Well, the last speaker was the coder. So we would check the first if statement. Well, the last speaker was not the initializer. So we move on to the next one. If the last speaker is the coder, then we're going to return the executor. The executor is going to try and execute the code. And then whenever it tries to execute it, whenever they're done, then we call the state transition function again. Then we go back in this if else statement. We eventually come down to if the last speaker is the executor, then we have if the execute is one, meaning it failed, then we would move back to the coder. We would return the coder. Or if it was successful, then we would return the scientist. So let's say it wasn't successful. So we got an exit code of one. We would now return the coder. Well, that means now the coder is going to try and hopefully revamp the code so that it does work based on whatever failed when the executor tried to execute it. So that means the coder tries to do something. And then whenever they're done, we call the state transition function again. Well, the last speaker in this case was the coder. So again, we would come down here and we would make it to this second if statement, say if the last speaker is the coder, then call the executor. Okay, the executor is going to try and execute the code again. Once they're done, if the last speaker is the executor again, right here, then this time, let's just say that it was successful. Well, it didn't have an executor of one, so it was successful, meaning that we now call the scientist. The scientist is then going to probably make a call to the LLM to have uh, some, some model summarize everything that was found or returned from the Python code. So once they're done with that, then we're going to call the state transition function again. Now, eventually we make it down this if else statement. So we say, if the last speaker is the scientist, then guess what? We're done. We just, you can just like return none. And that means we are done with the state flow. Now I know that was a lot. So redo that part if you didn't quite understand it. 
but we're going to go into the code now and actually execute it so then we can see how it actually runs. Okay, so here for the code, we're going to have two different files. We're going to have a main Python file and then our typical OpenAI config list.json file. So the first thing is we only need autogen for this, so you only import autogen. We need a config list where I use autogen's config list from JSON. And in this example, I am going to be using GPT-4 just so I can run this in a reasonable amount of time. However, if we look at the config list, whenever you go to use this, I have it set up to where if you want to use LM Studio, you're more than welcome to. If you want to use Olama, here it is. You just have to replace the model which with, with whichever model you pull using Olama. Or if you just want to use GPT-4 or even 3.5 Turbo, just put in your API key here. But the options will be here for you. And again, you know, just use the model, right? So if you want to, if I wanted to use LM Studio, I'll just put LM Studio here. And that's it. Then I create the LLM config with some just default settings for temperature, the seed, and timeout. And then we start creating the agents. Well, the initializer that we talked about, right? This is just the user proxy agent with the name. And we don't want this, this uh, agent to actually execute any code. So I just set it to false. The coder. So this is the coder agent that it will write um, the software that is going to uh, find some papers online for us. So this is just the prompt for it. We have the executor, which is another user proxy agent because we need a user proxy agent to actually execute the code from the coder. All right, you're going to use a user proxy agent to do that. And actually in the system message, that's it right here. Execute the code written by the coder and report the result. So I'm not going to be using Docker. So I set this to false and we will have a paper directory, hopefully, with the Python code. And then we have the scientist, which is going to categorize the papers after seeing their abstracts and then create a markdown table. One of the last two new things is the state transition that we talked about. All right, so I said in the state transition function, we take the last speaker, which was the last agent that spoke, and then we just had the group chat. And the reason we had the group chat is because um, we for the last speaker, for the executor, we want to know if the last message had an execode of one in it, meaning when I, tried to uh, when I tried to execute the code, it failed. That's all this is for, right? So we can get the group chat messages here. You know, this is, like I said, it's going to be if else statements, right? So if the last speaker was the initializer, then we return the coder, and then it's the coder's turn uh, to talk in the chat. And the same thing, if the last speaker was the coder, then it's the executor's turn. And then if the last speaker was the executor, we see if the last message had an executor of one in it, if it did, meaning it failed, then we return the coder. Otherwise, return the scientist. And then finally, if the last speaker was the scientist, then we return none. Okay, we had the group chat and the group chat manager. Now, the only difference here with the group chat is, like I had mentioned briefly, was that there is another property here that allows us to take in this function called state transition. So if you go into the group chat here, the class right here, you see there is a speaker selection method. All right, typically, um, this is just done. This is you basically put this in auto. I think that that's kind of been default for a while, but you can have a custom speaker selection function, right? We just create the function and they give you an example. They give you an example here, right? So basically you want to return, you want to return um, an agent and the function takes in the last speaker, which is an agent and the group chat. Okay, and that's all we need. So now all I'm going to do next is actually run the code and we'll just go through and you can see how the state flow works. All right, so we executed it and it worked. So again, we start with the initializer or in it was the name of that agent. Uh, we had the LM application papers from last week. Requirement is five to 10 papers from different domains. So the next state after the initializer state is over with, which is basically just sending this topic, it goes to the coder. Now we're in kind of the research state where we had the coder and the executor running. So the coder creates Python code, right? So it does all of this. Then it goes on to the executor. Well, the executor tried to execute this code, but as you can see here, we got an exit code of one. So that means that there was some failure. And then because of that, if it found an exit code of one, the state function is going to return the coder. So here we are back at the coder. So it seems like there was an error. So it tried to, uh, the coder tried to fix the issue. And then the executor tried to re-execute it. And now we have an X code of zero, meaning that there was no error. So we finally got an output, right? So I've got um, all these different papers here. I uh, don't need to go through all of them right now. And then finally, because we were done with that state now, the executor got executed code that was successful. We now move on to the last state, which is the scientist who is going to put all the summary of everything into a markdown table. 
So after I cop after I copied it in, we finally got um, the markdown preview. Okay, and we got the domain title, author summary, and the link, which is what we wanted. And they are each from different domains. Okay, and that's awesome. This is what we wanted. This is just another way that we can have different states control the flow of how the agents are going to talk to each other and perform the tasks. Okay, that was an introduction to state flow and state flow agents. This wasn't a huge example, but I hope like the PowerPoint kind of helped you understand how this works. And this is another way to control the flow of your agents. If you have any comments or anything you want to talk about, leave them down in the comment section below. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next video.